We are back again with On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365. I'm your host, Newsom, and we're back after the one-week break back at the Apex in Vegas for UFC Vegas 37. We have a bit of a strange fight card here as the main event is Anthony Smith versus Ryan Spann, which, to be honest, doesn't have any sort of major implications in the light heavyweight division, but it will be a good fight, a fun fight nonetheless. We also have 15 fights right now at the time of recording this podcast, which is very unusual. We will see how that number is though, come fight night on Saturday night. But if we still have 15 fights by fight night, I really hope the fight pacing between each fight is quick. But just before we get into the breakdowns, as always, there's a few things to mention in regards to MMA Play 365. The last event was a pretty good one. We did drop an underdog bet on Dalcha Lungiambula, who was also the money back guarantee dog of the week as well. It was a very strange Dalcha that showed up that night, and it was one of those fights where tape was almost rendered useless. However, we did cash our biggest bet of the night, which was a very easy money parlay on Tom Aspinall and Jack Shaw, which couldn't have been any more secure with how both fights played out. Our Fun Gamblers section also hit 8 out of the 12 parlay piece options as well. Remember, we have multiple packages on the MMA Play 365 website for all the UFC betting advice and DraftKings and FanDuel advice you'll ever need. We also have various subscription lengths and options too, so to see our full service list, please go and visit MMAPlay365.com for more information or to sign up today. And let's go, let's break down some fights. In the main event, we've got Anthony Smith versus Ryan Spann. Smith is currently the minus 167 favourite, the comeback on Spann, the plus 147 underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the value actually sits slightly with Ryan Spann as the underdog. Now, I'm not saying Ryan Spann's going to win the fight, of course, I'll break this down very shortly, but I do think that the betting line should be a little bit closer and that provides a little bit of value on Ryan Spann's money line. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, it looks like it's settled pretty much where it is. There is going to be some obvious fluctuation between now and Saturday. I do think that we are going to see some span money coming in. If enough span money comes in, then of course, I do think we'll see Smith money coming back at it. I do think Anthony Smith's going to come into the fight roughly around the minus 150, minus 155 line, with Ryan Spann sitting at around plus 135. Now, as for how this fight plays out, it's an interesting one because... I'm not really sure where Ryan Spann fits in regards to how high his ceiling is in the division. He has results and goes into fights where he looks amazing, but then he'll have another fight where he doesn't look quite as good as what he did last time out. So I think the performances are just a little inconsistent, but he's not a bad fighter where... With Anthony Smith, he's been in the UFC for years. You sort of know what you're going to get from Smith. He only really has the bad performances when he's fighting against the upper echelon in the division. So, for example, the Glover to Teixeira fight, you know, he looked good for a round. But after then, he didn't really look so good. But Glover to Teixeira is now fighting for the title against Jan Blachowicz. So, that's what I mean. When Smith gets to the upper end of the division that's where he does start to have some problems but Ryan Spann isn't up there but Ryan Spann does still come with his dangers I've still got some question marks on Smith's durability you know he is later in his career even though he's not so old he's got a lot of mileage on the clock in regards to MMA he's fought a lot of times which you know that does take precedent over the age when you're looking at it from that perspective so he's taken a lot of damage over the years he's had a lot of fights now one thing with Ryan Spann I don't think he's as technical as Anthony Smith especially especially when it comes to the striking. Smith is definitely more technical and he's more varied with his attacks as well. But Ryan Spann's got the youth in this fight in regards to, like I say, just not having as many fights and not taking as much damage. He's athletic, he's powerful. So if he does catch Smith with something, there is a possibility that he can knock him out. And Spann's also very tricky with his submissions as well. But Anthony Smith has also got good Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So submitting Smith isn't going to be easy. I think it would have to be more of a Spann hurt Smith and then submits him while he's hurt if that submission does happen. But in regards to the striking, the technical striking, like I say, I think Smith is the more technical striker. I think he's got better volume. He's more proven over five rounds as well. He's been five rounds a couple of times, whereas Ryan Spann hasn't in the UFC. So I think Smith has got more experience fighting. He's got more experience in five rounds. He's the slightly more technical fighter. And what this amounts to, in my opinion, is one of those fights where I feel that Ryan Spann is going to be very active, very lively and very dangerous early on in this fight. 
There might be a storm that has to be weathered for Smith, but I think the longer the fight goes on, if we start hitting late into round two, into round three, or then into the championship rounds, I do think that sort of fight favours Smith the longer it goes on. I think Smith's cardio will hold up a little bit better. It does obviously depend if Span causes real serious damage in those early stages of the fight, and in that case, what I've just said, it might not go as planned, but generally speaking, I think Span's going to have good moments early on in this fight, I'm not sure that he's able to get Smith out. Smith's tough and he's been in there with some really dangerous fighters and managed to weather storms and survive late. But I don't think that Span's got that killer instinct late in fights. I don't think if we see a fourth or a fifth round that Span's going to still be hunting for a finish. As I've said a couple of times already, I think the longer the fight goes on, it favours Smith. And I do think the fight does go into the deep waters here. I do think we will see the fight go late into the second, into the third, maybe even into the championship round rounds and that's where I favour Smith so although Span is absolutely dangerous early on and this is why I think the line should be much closer as well much shorter because Span is definitely live early in this fight but I do trust Smith's experience I trust his five round experience and I do think he's the better technical fighter as well and I think the fight's going to be won and lost on the feet so that's where I give Smith the slight advantages here I do think the fight goes deep and because of that I'm picking Anthony Smith to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Iwan Kutalaba versus Devin Clark. Kutalaba is currently the minus 145 favourite, the comeback on Clark at plus 125 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the line's quite accurate if I'm being honest. This is where I think you'd expect to see the betting line. And I do think if you are going to push me for a slight value side, I would edge very slightly onto Kutalaba, but like I say, I think the bookies have got this one right, and I think it's sitting exactly where it should be. Now, as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, again, I think it's settled in the right spot. I don't see the betting line flinging off rapidly into one direction. There's going to be some obvious fluctuation. I think we'll see some Clark money coming in, and if that comes in enough, then I think we'll see money coming back in on Kutalaba, but ultimately, I think the betting line is going to close roughly where it's sitting right about now. Now as for how this fight plays out, I think it's quite an obvious fight to analyse if I'm being honest. I think you've either got Kutalaba early in this fight or you've got Devin Clark late but again like I've just said with Smith and Spam, it does depend how much damage Clark would take early in that round or sorry early in the fight from Kutalaba depending on how he looks later in the fight but ultimately Kutalaba he doesn't change from fight to fight. You know what you're going to get from him. He's going to come out hard, he's going to come out aggressive, he's going to look to put your head in to Rose Ed, and if he doesn't do that he's going to tire and he's going to allow his opponent to take over so for me it's either Kutalaba inside of round one maybe inside of seven and a half minutes but then if that doesn't happen it's going to be Devin Clark that grinds the rest of the fight out if Kutalaba is dangerous for seven and a half minutes it does depend on how bad that second two and a half minutes is because obviously that's halfway into round two to determine if Devin Clark's going to win a decision, if that makes sense. But ultimately, if Kutalaba doesn't get Clark out of there in round one, I think that Clark's wrestling is going to take over slowly. I think he is going to be able to score takedowns on Kutalaba late should the fight go late. And if that does happen and Devin Clark does go relentless with his wrestling, then he's going to pull away later on in the fight. The problem is, I'm not quite sure I trust Devin Clark's durability in those early stages in the fight. I know we say, oh, if Kutalaba doesn't get him out in round one, then, you know, Clark's going to take over. So Clark must be the favoured fighter in this fight. I don't think it quite works like that with Kutalaba, especially with Clark being his opponent, because that first five minutes is going to be a long five minutes for Devin Clark. He's going to have to defend. He's going to be shooting for desperate takedowns if he's hurt. I think Kutalaba initially is going to be able to defend those desperate takedowns while he's fresh. He's strong. He's physical while he's fresh. He's also a Greco-Roman wrestler so he's got that strong upper body as well so whilst he's fresh I don't see Devin Clark being able to get takedowns or at least not get them easily and I think Kutalaba will be able to stand back up early where Clark's going to get Kutalaba is later in the fight when he's tired and he's not as physical and he's not as strong but in those early moments I think Kutalaba's going to put it on Clark I think he's going to have him backed up against the cage I think he's going to be firing hard shots at him uppercuts wide hooks against the cage I do think he catches him with something if he doesn't like I said, the obvious risk is that Devin Clark does take over the longer the fight goes on. But I think with Kutalaba's aggression, his power and his strength early in this fight is going to be enough to get Clark out of there. I'm picking Iwan Kutalaba to win this fight. 
And in the next fight, we've got Mandy Bomb versus Ariane Lipsky. Lipsky's currently the slight minus 115 favourite. The comeback on Bomb, the slight minus 105 underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, it's one of those fights where if you've got a good read, then either side is bettable. Like I said, as long as you've got that good read. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, there's been a little bit of fluctuation and back and forth with this betting line. Obviously, the fight was supposed to happen on the last fight card, but it got moved back to this one. Lipsky did open up the slight plus money underdog, but all that money's coming on her. The line's flipped a little bit, but it's still relatively close and it has been close since the betting line was released. I do expect to see that trend continue throughout fight week. I really wouldn't be surprised to see the line flip again and see Bomb turn into the minus 115 favourite with Lipsky at minus 105. But ultimately, whichever way it does go, it is going to be really close. And I think both fighters step into the cage on Saturday night roughly around that pick and price. Now, as for how this fight plays out, it's a really interesting fight because... Both fighters are very similar. They're both aggressive strikers. They both like to come forward, get into the face of their opponents. They've both got takedowns as well. They've both got good topside Brazilian jiu-jitsu and actually the weakness of both fighters as well is being on the back. The defensive Brazilian jiu-jitsu, they can get stuck on the back as well. So you will see the same sort of style from both fighters here. So it's ultimately how are they going to match up against each other? Where is the fight going to be won and lost? In regards to where the fight's won and lost, I think the better work is going to be done on the feet. But honestly, if one of these fighters decides to change things up, shoot a takedown, complete a takedown and get on top of their opponent, then it's going to change the fight for them because they will have success on top of their opponent. You know, if Lipsky takes Bohm down, Bohm is a bit of a guard player. She will close a guard. She does struggle to get back up to her feet and she spends a lot of time on her back. And Lipsky's quite the same in a way, but she is a little bit different. She will try and work off her back. She will try and get back up. But ultimately, I just think a defensive BJJ does get her stuck on her back. So it's almost like she's trying to get back up to her feet, but just can't. Whereas Bohm just flat out lays on her back for minutes on end and will lose rounds that way. But the level of competition that Bohm's been fighting isn't been massively high. So she has been able to get back up to her feet when she has been taken down but I do believe if Lipsky gets on top of her Lipsky's top game is going to be enough to you know really cause Bohm some troubles here I think Bohm's the more technical striker in regards to using more varied attacks like elbows like knees I think she's slightly more dangerous in the clinch as well whereas Lipsky's going to be more dangerous inside of that boxing range pushing forwards so they have got a slight difference in regards to their attacks I think Lipsky's more powerful more aggressive whereas Bones slightly more technical so it's going to be an interesting fight of how they match up personally I think that the experience of Lipsky she's fought in the UFC so many times now she's been in KSW as well which again is is another credible promotion so I think the experience that Lipsky's got I think will give her the slight edge in this fight I don't think it's going to be a whitewash I don't think it's going to be a comfortable fight for Lipsky I think Bohm's definitely going to give her a fight she's going to have a moment it could even be one of those razor close split decisions but I just think that Lipsky might be able to back Bohm up where Bohm's not as efficient striking as what she is moving forwards and I think Lipsky might shoot the takedowns here Bohm's more opportunistic with the takedown attempts, whereas I think Lipsky could come in here with a purpose and look to the wrestling to take Bohm down. If she sees the tape, she sees that she has holes there, I think Lipsky's the more likely fighter to go down that path rather than Bohm. So I think there's slightly more ways here for Lipsky to win this fight, and it's for those reasons I'm picking Ariane Lipsky to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Christos Iagos versus the return of Armin Sarukian. Sarukian is currently the minus 750 favourite. The comeback on Yargos at plus 525 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, even though the betting line on Sarukian is very wide, is the biggest favourite on the card at minus 750. And with that said, I do think there is more value on that minus 750 betting line than there is at plus 525 on Christos Iargos. And as for where this betting line moves throughout the rest of fight week, obviously, as you can imagine, Armin Sarukian's betting line has just been growing and growing by the day. Now, like I said, it's sat at minus 750, is minus 800 in other spots, minus 850 in some books as well. So I do think that it's going to continue to climb, but 
Honestly, I'm not quite sure we see minus 900 or minus 1,000. I do think it's going to be settled between minus 750 and minus 850, and it's going to close somewhere in that region. Now, as for how this fight plays out, it's obviously a very difficult fight for Iargos. There's a reason why he's a plus 525 underdog. I do think the one path to victory for Iargos, though, is to just be aggressive and land something early on Sarukian. That's obviously what most of us call a puncher's chance, which pretty much every fighter in MMA has that puncher's chance with the volatility and the variance that we see in the sport. But I do think that Iargos has got to just go for broke in round one, just come forward, be aggressive and look to land something hard on Saruki and hurt him and maybe finish him. Other than that, it's really difficult to see Iargos winning this fight because Sarukian is the better technical striker. He's the better mover inside the cage. He's the better wrestler. He's the better grappler, both offensively and defensively. And the big thing here for Sarukian is the cardio his cardio is just off the scales he can go three rounds absolutely no problem at all without you know slowing down or needing a breather whereas Iargos that's one of his big downfalls you know he can start fast in fights he's big for the division but he always slows down later in fights so even if he does have a good round against Sarukin you know a good round one if he doesn't get Sarukin out of there Sarukin's still just going to take over the fight and to be honest with you if Iargos does win round one he's going to have to work extremely hard to to win that first round which again is going to drain his gas tank like I say I just don't think that outside of a flash finish or maybe not a flash finish maybe he just hits Sarukian and wobbles him and manages to jump on a finish and have that killer instinct a bit like Paddy Pimblett in the last event if that happens then fair enough but outside of that it's just really difficult to see Iargos winning this fight because Sarukian's just better everywhere I don't believe that Iargos is going to knock Sarukian out obviously there's always that possibility there's no definites in MMA but I just think it's a really low percentage probability of Iargos knocking Sarukin out and therefore I think Sarukin's just going to be the better striker the better wrestler the better grappler with the better cardio and for those reasons I'm picking Armin Sarukin to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Nate Maness versus Tony Gravely Gravely is currently the minus 210 favourite, the comeback on Maynus at plus 175 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I think the betting line again is sitting roughly where it should be, where you'd expect it to be. But if you are going to push me for a value side, I would say that there is still slight value at minus 210 on Gravely opposed to the plus 175 of Nate Maynus. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, it has been fluctuating a lot. Tony Gravely was down at minus 165, minus 175, minus 180. But over the last couple of days, all that money's been coming back in on him. And I do tend to agree with that line movement. Like I said, I think it's sitting where it should be sitting right now. I don't think it's going to move too much now. I think if there is any more money coming in on this fight, we might see Gravely go up to minus 225, maybe minus 230. But I think there's going to be a brick wall there. I think if he gets to there, people will be betting Maynus, who would be around plus 185, plus 190 at that sort of betting line. But ultimately, when both fighters step into the cage on Saturday night, I think the betting line is going to be sitting roughly where it is right about now now as for how this fight plays out i think we're going to see a real mixed martial arts fight here in regards to seeing a bit of striking seeing a bit of clinch work wrestling grappling i think we're going to see it all now in regards to the striking of both fighters i do think Maynus is the more technical striker but i think gravel is probably the more dangerous striker as well Maynus, a lot of his shots are straight down the middle he does come in with bursts of aggression his volume's not exactly there but neither is Gravely's either you know both fighters fighting bursts it's just Maynus is straight punches accumulation of volume whereas Gravely is more of I'm going to try and knock you out type of striking so from a striking perspective I don't see a huge edge either way because I think like I say Maynus is the better technical striker but Gravely is the more dangerous striker but where I think this fight is going to go like I said I think we're going to see clinch work I think we're going to see wrestling and grappling and that's where Gravely comes into this fight because Gravely is an experienced wrestler, solid wrestling credentials. You can see that in his game as well. He's got a variety of different takedowns. He's got a really good body lock throw, actually. Clinching up with his opponents, getting double underhooks and throwing his opponent down to the mat. But he's also got that traditional wrestling takedown style as well. Single legs, double legs. He turns the corner really well. His completion rate's good as well. If he wants to get this fight to the mat, he's going to be able to get it to the mat. Now, I know Maynus, we haven't seen him taken down too many times. His takedown defense actually isn't that bad. He can keep himself upright, but he's also never fought a wrestler like Gravely. So I do think that Maynus will get taken down in this fight. But it's all about what Maynus does 
after that point because Gravely can lay heavy on top but he can also leave spaces and gaps openings for his opponent to explode out of you can't be too concerned with his defensive BJJ in regards to Gravely because he did fight Defratus where Defratus was looking for arm bars and triangles and he did get close a couple of times but Gravely knows what he's doing down there on top to stay safe so it all depends what Manus does in this fight ultimately I do think Manus will be able to stand back up to his feet once or twice especially early on and then get back to his striking that might tire gravelly a little bit and that's my only real worry for gravelly if this fight goes late i think manus's cardio is going to be slightly better than gravelly's but with that being said we don't know what a relentless wrestling pressure game from an opponent of manus is gonna do to his gas tank because we've not seen it he might also be tired late in the fight should it go there Ultimately, I think Gravely is going to be able to score multiple takedowns in this fight. I think Manus will be able to get back up to his feet for the first few. But the more the takedowns come, I think that's just going to hurt the morale of Manus. It's going to really deflate him inside the cage. And the longer the fight goes on, the more it should favour Gravely. Gravely is a powerhouse. He's strong. He's physical. He can take you down from many different positions. I think for Manus, he's got to keep his distance in this fight. He is the taller fighter. Not so much in regards to a massive reach advantage, but a 5-inch height advantage. So he's going to have to keep himself on the outside to stop Gravely getting in and shooting takedowns. But I think that's just going to be really difficult to do for 15 minutes with the type of fighter Gravely is. With strength, with pressure, with aggression being in the small cage. I think it's all things that do favour Gravely. So I am picking Tony Gravely to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Joaquin Buckley versus Antonio Ahoyo. Buckley is currently the minus 200 favourite. The comeback on Ahoyo at plus 170 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I kind of think the value sits with the underdog in Ahoyo here again, like I said with Ryan Spann. I'm not saying that Ahoyo is going to win the fight, but when you look at the betting line, I think the betting line should be lined much closer due to this fight potentially being crazy, powerful and explosive. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, the line seems to have settled where it is now. Ahoyo, a few days ago, was close to a plus 200 underdog, but a lot of money's come in on him. It's closed the line a little bit, but it seems to have settled right now. So I think that we might see some money coming in on Buckley at minus 200, but if it goes any wider, I think we'll just see money coming back in on Ahoyo and rightly so because I do think the line is too wide where it is right now ultimately I do think Ahoyo is going to come into this fight roughly around a plus 160 favorite that should have Buckley at around minus 180 minus 185 and I think that's where the betting line closes now as for how this fight plays out the early moments in this fight is going to be absolutely nuts because Ahoyo has actually got a fight that he will like here this from a stylistic perspective he's fought wrestlers he's fought fighters that are going to take him down grapplers as well like Andre Muniz fighters that want to submit him but finally he's going to get a fighter that's going to want to stand in front of him and trade back that's exactly what Ahoyo wants. Ahoyo doesn't want to be taken down and have to deal with defensive wrestling and grappling. He wants to stand in the pocket or stand on the outside, switching stances and throwing hard kicks. He's a very kick heavy striker, whereas Buckley is a very punch heavy striker so it's going to be really interesting from a stylistic perspective if Buckley's closing the distance often being aggressive getting inside of that boxing range then he's going to have advantages in this fight and he's probably going to knock Ohio out but Ohio, if he can keep this fight on the outside and start landing hard kicks on Buckley we saw Buckley get knocked out in his last fight by a head kick you know if that's Ohio's kick then he's going out even harder so if Ahoyo keeps it on the outside then it's going to be a good fight for him and he's probably going to win but where I see a massive problem for Ahoyo in this fight is if something doesn't happen in round one that finishes the fight the longer this fight goes on Ahoyo gasses really hard whereas we don't really see that from Buckley sure he slows down a little bit as any fighter does who has that sort of power aggression and fights at a fast pace. But Ahoyo really does slow down and it's massively concerning. If this fight gets into round three, Buckley's still going to be live. Which means that Buckley's live for a finish in round one, in round two and in round three. Whereas for me, Ahoyo is live for a finish in round one, maybe at the start of round two. But if the finish hasn't come then, I do question his cardio. And that's why I think that Buckley is the favourite. Like I said, I do think the betting line's still too wide because Ohio is going to come forward hard and he has a finishing ability that 
Buckley got finished by in his last fight. So I do think the line's wide for that reason, but I do understand why Buckley is the favourite, just because I think that he is going to be able to take this fight late. He's going to be able to weather a storm, I think, and he's going to be dangerous for a finish in each round, but also he's got more volume and activity the longer the fight goes on. And I do think that his way of pressing forward and being aggressive and getting inside to boxing range is very efficient. And because of that, I do think that Ohio is going to be on the back foot more than than he'd like to be and again that's not very good for a fighter a striker that likes moving forward with not a great gas tank so when you really start to piece everything together I do think that Joaquin Buckley is the more likely fighter to win the fight he's got more paths to victory and he's going to be dangerous for more rounds than his opponent and for those reasons I'm picking Joaquin Buckley to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Tafon Chukwe versus Mike Rodriguez Chukwe is currently the minus 125 favorite the comeback on Rodriguez at plus 105 as the underdog as for where the value is on the betting line I think the value sits with the underdog in Mike Rodriguez at plus 105 I do think the line should be at least a pick him there's an argument for Rodriguez potentially being a favorite as well but I do think the value is on that plus money on the money line as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week people love Tafon Chukwe and so do I he's a really fun fighter to watch just because of who he is how he moves how big he is for the division so for that reason I do think that money will come in on Chukwe over the last couple of days it has been fluctuating a little bit money coming in on Chukwe and then money coming back in on Rodriguez but I think the closer we get to fight night I think we are going to see Chukwe widen on the betting line and I do think he's going to close roughly around minus 135 minus 140 with Rodriguez being around plus 110 plus 115 but as for how this fight plays out like I say I'm not in total agreement with the betting line. I do get it to an extent, but I think that Chukwe's volume is a real problem and his stats are misleading. His stats will tell you that he lands six strikes per minute, which is quite a high average, but those numbers are a little bit inflated because of that one fight against Jamie Pickett where he did put a high number of volume of strikes out there. But aside from that, when you look at his other fights, he does wait a little bit too much. He's not a combination striker. He's not a fighter that will constantly be pouring out volume. So therefore he's not as active as other fighters but Rodriguez is like that Rodriguez will be looking to throw constant volume and I think stylistically one of the big advantages that Rodriguez has in this fight two things actually first is height and his reach his reach isn't so much of a difference but it's going to be six foot four against the six foot of Chukwe so four inches there but then what really plays into the stylistic advantages is the fact that Mike Rodriguez is a tall long southpaw fighting the orthodox stance of Chukwe. So I think the body kicks of Mike Rodriguez are definitely going to be there. Chukwe must cut a ton of weight to make this weight class as well. So for me, if Rodriguez is firing a lot of kicks to the body, he might wear Chukwe out. He might tire him out quite early on in this fight. But coming back from Chukwe... Rodriguez has got to be careful here. He can't stay in boxing range exchanging strikes with Chukwe because Chukwe does pack power and he will fire hard inside of boxing range. We've seen Mike Rodriguez knocked out before. I don't think he's the most durable fighter when something hard and clean connects, which is what you're going to get from Chukwe. So as long as Rodriguez minds his P's and Q's and he's got to mind his P's and Q's, especially in that boxing range, I do think that he's going to be able to be the more active fighter and the more efficient strike striker as well and I think that's where the fight's going to be won and lost on the feet I think if anybody looks for a takedown it might be Chukwe but I think Rodriguez should be able to defend takedown should Chukwe come in with that game plan but ultimately the southpaw versus orthodox is a stylistic advantage for Rodriguez Rodriguez I think will be able to fire kicks from the outside potentially tire Chukwe out I think he's got the slightly better cardio he's got power himself as well and I just think the overall activity and volume levels of Rodriguez will be greater than Chukwe's. So for those reasons, I'm picking Mike Rodriguez to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Panik Kianzad versus Raquel Pennington. Pennington is currently the minus 130 favourite, the comeback on Kianzad at plus 110 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think that the value sits with Panik Kianzad, the underdog at plus 110. I think the fight, like I've just said in the last fight, should be close to a pick. I and mean, if Kianzad was the slight favourite, I wouldn't have too many issues with that either. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, we've seen the lines move a lot since the opener. Pennington opened at minus 150, Kianzad opened at plus 
plus 120. So all that money's coming on Kianzad. It's closed the line up a little bit. It did get very close to a pick but then money came back in on Pennington. And I do think the money on Pennington is going to be the trend from now until fight day on Saturday. But I don't think it's going to move rapidly. I do think we're just going to see a slowly increase of it. And I think when both fighters step into the cage on Saturday night, I think Pennington will be around minus 140, minus 145, with Panicky Anzad sitting at around that plus 115, potentially back at that plus 120 opener. Now, as for how this fight plays out, it's going to be a good fight, I think. And Pennington's obviously a veteran. She's been in there with the best fighters the UFC's had to offer over so many years. She's always been up there in the division. She's always been putting out solid performances, even when she's outmatched and, like I said, fighting the best in the division. But with Kianzad, I feel that Kianzad has got youth on her side. I feel that when you're looking at the striking now, yes, Pennington's probably still going to be the more aggressive fighter. She might be stronger inside the clinch as well. But Pani Kianzad, I think, is going to be the quicker striker, the quicker mover, the more technical striker as well. So even if Pennington does close the distance, tries to grind and make this ugly, I think that Kianzad's got good work inside of the clinch. She's got good elbow. She's got good knees. She might just get a little overrun with the strength from Pennington, but if she can land some good strikes in the clinch and then exit and angle out, then she's going to be able to get a striking going again. Now, like I say, I think Pennington packs more power in the striking and she's going to be the fighter that wants to be in the face of her opponent. I think Kianzad's going to want to be on the outside using her speed, moving in and out of range, landing strikes. But that's where I think that Kianzad has got the edge in this fight. And I think from a striking perspective, we're going to see slightly more volume from Kianzad. I think Kianzad, as I've already mentioned, is going to be the quicker mover, the quicker striker. That's going to allow the activity levels to be there. Where I am a little bit worried for Kianzad is if Pennington does take her down. Now, Kianzad's got good takedown defense, but we did see when she slipped against Bechko here. And I had a bet on Kianzad there, I think a minus 110 pick and where it might have been minus 125. But that was the only part of that fight that I was worried about. She slipped, Bechko here got on top of Kianzad and Kianzad did struggle to get back up to her feet. So for me, if Pennington does have a game plan where she's looking for takedowns and she does manage to get on top of Kianzad, that could be the round over there. And that's really where my only concern is. But it's not like Pennington's a beast takedown artist. She might score one takedown, but she's got to get Kianzad settled. If Kianzad feels herself going down, start the scrambling, get back up to your feet. And I think that's what she'll do. I'm not ruling out a takedown, but I don't think that Pennington's style, especially in 2021, is going to be a relentless wrestling style where she's just spamming takedowns and looking to get the fight down to the mat. I think the fight's close enough on the feet, but like I say, the speed, the volume, the activity levels, I do give an advantage there for Kianzad. And for those reasons, with me believing the fight is going to be won and lost on the feet, I am picking Pani Kianzad to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Dakota Harry Bush versus Rongju. Bush is currently the minus 130 favourite, the comeback on Rongju at plus 110 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the value sits with the underdog in Rongju at plus 110. It isn't going to be a whitewash and it is going to be a relatively close fight with both fighters having the moments, but I do think that Rongju, again, like I've said in the last two breakdowns, it should at least be a pick him. And if Rongju was a slight favourite, I wouldn't have any issues with that either. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, we've seen a lot of fluctuation here, a bit of back and forth. At the minute, the money's coming back in on Rongju. Dakota Bush did go out to minus 130. Minus 140 in some spots, but that money's come back in on Rongju, and I do tend to agree with that line movement. I do think when both fighters step into the cage on Saturday night, it's going to close up a little bit, but I do think Dakota Bush is going to come in the minus 120 or minus 125 favourite, with Rongju being at around plus 100, plus 105. Now, as for how this fight plays out, I think both fighters match up really well, and that's because they're both similar. Both have got decent striking, slightly different striking. I'll touch upon that in a minute, but both have got decent wrestling. It's more opportunity opportunistic though that opposed to forcing anything in the wrestling department and they've both got good grappling as well both offensively and defensively so it's going to make for a good fight now from a striking perspective I think Dakota Bush is more a kick heavy striker he's not a full-on kickboxer but I think he throws more kicks than what Rong Zhu will throw Rong Zhu is more about the hands combinations straight punches down the middle he's got power in his hands so that's something that is definitely give him an edge in this fight from a finishing perspective now with Dakota Bush I think he is the more likely fighter out of 
the two to actually go to his wrestling. Rong Zhu will take an opportunity if it's presented in regards to offensive wrestling, but Bush for me is the more likely to offensively wrestle, especially when he starts feeling the power of Rong Zhu on the feet and the combinations. I think it might force him to his wrestling here, but Rong Zhu's got good defensive BJJ. He can sprawl well, he sees takedowns coming well, and if he is taken down, the only side of it I don't like from Rong Zhu is sometimes he can spend a little too long on his back, but ultimately he is active off his back, he doesn't close his guard, he will look for submissions, sweeps, reversals, and he'll try and stand back up to his feet eventually as well. So I don't think that the fight is necessarily going to be won and lost in the wrestling with the grappling because I just don't see a massive edge there on either side. I think the majority of this fight plays out on the feet. I think Dakota Bush is going to try and land kicks from range, whereas Rong Zhu is going to try and close the distance, get inside a punching range and land some hard punches. I think that Rong Zhu is slightly more aggressive. The one thing I don't like from Dakota Bush from a striking perspective is his hands can be held really low. And Rong Zhu, when he sees an opening, he will throw a two or three punch combination with power behind it. So that's dangerous considering Dakota to Bush can leave his hands a little bit low at times. I think Bush is going to have advantages when it comes to offensive wrestling, but like I said, I do think that Rong Zhu can nullify that slight advantage a little bit just by being able to use his defensive jujitsu to get back up to his feet relatively quickly. I think the fight, I think the fight is going to be won and lost on the feet because the bigger moments are going to be on the feet, and I see those bigger moments coming from Rong Zhu. It's going to be close. I think both fighters are going to have the moments in different areas, but ultimately I think that it's going to come down to the striking, the hard shots that Rongju lands, I think he's got more chance of finishing Bush than the other way around as well so for those reasons I'm picking Rongju to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got a fight between two newcomers into the UFC. We've got Nicholas Motta versus Cameron Van Camp. Motta is currently the minus 310 favourite. The comeback on Van Camp at plus 255 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I think the betting line is sitting where I'd expect it to be, if I'm being honest. And actually, if you push me for a value side, I would say that the minus 310 line on Motta is the better bet than Van Camp at plus 255. I think the short notice opportunity for Van Camp isn't going to help and the weight cut as well, which is things I'll talk about very shortly. So I do think that the line is accurate, but Motta still has slight value at minus 310. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, I do think the line's pretty settled. I don't think it's going to ping off in any direction. I don't think we're going to see Motta up at minus 400. In fact, I think if anything, we are going to see money on Van Camp. So I do think Motta's going to come into this fight roughly around the minus 280, 285 betting line with Van Camp being around that plus 240 line. Now, as for how this fight plays out, as I've already mentioned, Van Camp stepping in on short notice to take this fight. Nicholas Motta was supposed to fight Jim Miller and the fight was pretty much a pick -em. In some books, they had Motta as the favourite. So I think with Motta being a favourite or a pick -em against somebody like Jim Miller, really tells you how high people are on Nicholas Motta and it's easy to see why. But the other side of it as well, Van Camp is coming in at lightweight. This is a lightweight fight. He's fought predominantly at welterweight. He has fought at lightweight before, but not for a lot of years. And now he's taking a short notice fight with the weight cut. It's a little bit sketchy. You know, there's red flags there for sure. But with Nicholas Motta, he's a very striking heavy fighter, especially with his boxing. But he's got power in his hands, both hands. He puts combinations together really well. He's more of actually a counter striker, reactive striker, than actually pushing forwards and being aggressive. Of course, he has moments where he is aggressive, pushing forwards, getting in his opponent's face and getting inside that boxing range. But he does like to react at what his opponent throws at him. And his reaction time, his counter-striking accuracy is just off the scale. When an opponent throws something at him, he'll see it coming. He'll react to it. He'll counter it. But the counters come in hard combinations. Left hook, straight right hand. He's got power in both hands. We see him drop pretty much every fighter that he fights. We see him with knockouts. We see him put together brutal combinations, cut his opponents up so again Motta has just got huge advantages in this striking department because Van Camp's more of a grappler his wrestling is okay we have seen him take opponents down but this is regional 
level opponent. I'm not sure he's going to be able to take Motta down very easily. Motta can be taken down, but he's also got really good takedown defense. He gets his underhooks really well, spreads his base really well, and he does defend takedowns well. If he is taken down, he will initially scramble up to the feet. He's got to be careful of the front chokes here though as well, because if he does get taken down, he does generally get back up to his feet and gives his neck or exposes his neck a little bit. So he's got to be careful there. That's definitely something Van Camp can try and take advantage of. But again, the change of opponent for Motta, I don't think matters. Motta was actually preparing for a better opponent, an opponent who is a submission specialist, who has got good wrestling. So he was basically preparing for a better version of Van Camp. So I don't think the change of opponent makes a difference for him. He's going to be well prepared here. I think that Van Camp is going to be shooting relentlessly for takedowns. I think the weight cut could potentially be harsh for him. So if the fight goes longer, I'd expect Motta, who doesn't really tire to really start putting the pressure on. Like I said with Joaquin Buckley and Ahoyo early on, Motta's got a live finishing opportunity in round one in round two and in round three. He'll be able to do it in any of the rounds and that makes him dangerous in this spot. Cameron Van Camp might have some good moments early in the fight, but I think the power of Motta is really going to make Van Camp hesitant to get inside a boxing range to close the distance to try and shoot takedowns. I think Motta is the more likely fighter to finish the fight. is the more likely fighter to win a decision as well. For those reasons, I'm picking Nicholas Motta to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got the return of Montel Jackson versus JP Bays. Jackson is currently the minus 600 favourite. The comeback on Bayes at plus 450 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, again, I understand why Montel Jackson is at minus 600. I completely understand the betting line and why it's there, which I'll explain very shortly. And actually, if you are going to push me for a value side, I would say the minus 600 of Jackson is a better bet. Obviously not straight, potentially in a parlay than the plus 450 of JP Bays. And as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, I do think that we're going to see a little bit more money coming in on Montel Jackson. Again, like I said, I've got a funny feeling he's going to be a popular parlay piece. So I think that minus 600 will rise and I think we will see it up at minus 650, potentially minus 700. But I just don't think it's going to get too wider than minus 700 so I think it's going to be anywhere between that minus 600 and minus 700 come fight night on Saturday night now as for how this fight plays out to be fair to JP Bays he's not a bad fighter and I do think he has a path to victory here in regards to relentless wrestling and just being able to consistently take Montel Jackson down it's how Brett Johns beat Montel Jackson Montel Jackson was the better striker but Brett Johns was just relentless in that fight was constantly hunting for takedowns Montel Jackson kept on getting back up. Brett Johns had to complete eight takedowns and ultimately he won the fight. And JP Bays has got to follow that same game plan as what Brett Johns had because if he doesn't, JP Bays is at a big height disadvantage, a big reach disadvantage, a technical striking disadvantage as well. So JP Bays is going to get beaten, lit up on the feet by Montel Jackson. So he's got to go to his wrestling and often. But the thing is with Brett Johns, one thing that helped him in that fight against Jackson is that Brett Johns was a legit Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He was a really, really strong grappler. And although JP Bays is a good grappler as well, I just don't think he's the same caliber as Brett Johns. So I'm not sure that he's going to have too much success after the takedowns. And that's even if we see the same amount of takedowns from Bays as what we saw from Brett Johns as well. The reason I keep mentioning the Brett Johns fight is because that's the blueprint in this fight for JP. Bays. I think Bays is going to score a couple of takedowns along the way, but Montel Jackson's not even a bad defensive wrestler. Brett Johns was just that good, that relentless, that he was able to consistently take Montel Jackson down. Montel Jackson does have good fundamentals when it comes to his defensive wrestling, and he's also deceptively strong as well. He's also long, so he's going to be able to get the double underhooks in nicely. He's going to be harder to take down as well because he's so long. I think JP Bays, like I said, he's going to get a couple of takedowns along the way, but I don't think it's going to have that much of an effect on the outcome of the fight. I think Montel Jackson's striking is just on a completely different level to JP Bays. He's obviously got big physical advantages, like I've said, with the height and the reach as well. I think he's going to be able to pour on a lot of volume with JP Bays as well. I think Montel Jackson is live for a finish, but if he doesn't get a finish, I think his activity levels across the three rounds on the feet will be enough 
to beat JP Baze if the fight was to go to a decision as well. Ultimately, I think the fight is going to be won and lost on the feet, even though we will see wrestling from JP Bays, and that's where I think Montel Jackson has just got huge advantages in this fight, really big advantages, and I just don't see Bays being able to overcome those advantages and get his wrestling game going enough for it to have a positive outcome for him on the fight. I think Montel Jackson, like I said, he's the one that's more likely to finish this fight. If the fight goes to a decision, I think he's going to have the better moments across the three rounds as well, and for those reasons, I'm picking Montel Jackson to win this fight. And in the next fight, we finally get to see the debut of Erin Blanchfield as she fights Sarah Alpar. Blanchfield is currently the minus 310 favourite, the comeback on Alpar, the plus 255 underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, even though the line's wide and Blanchfield's a big favourite, I do understand why she's that big of a favourite, and I do think the minus 310 line on Blanchfield is the better bet than the plus 255 on Alpar's betting line. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, I do think we're going to see a slow and steady increase of money coming in on Blanchfield again. I think she's going to be a popular parlay piece for some people, which will widen the betting line and ultimately come fight night on Saturday night I do think Blanchfield's going to be much closer to minus 400 than she will be to minus 300. Now as for how this fight plays out we've actually got a bit of clash of styles here because both fighters prefer to wrestle and prefer to grapple opposed to striking. The striking's quite close I do think Blanchfield's improving and developing as a young fighter in that striking department and Alpar does have some physical advantages in this fight. I think she's a very big fighter for the weight division. I think she comes with strength and power as well. So although Blanchfield may have a slight edge in the striking, technically I think Alpar can be more aggressive and try and impose her will in regards to her physicality a little bit more. But ultimately, I think this fight's going to be won and lost in what happens in the wrestling and the grappling departments. Like I said, Alpar does have physical advantages. She is going to be strong inside the clinch, so she might be able to score her own takedowns here but I think Blanchfield in regards to her grappling her positioning her sweeps her reversals her transitioning once she's topside as well from position to position she's just really solid down on the mat in regards to a Brazilian jiu-jitsu and that's just talking about what happens if Sarah Alpar takes her down if Blanchfield scores a takedown in this fight I think Alpar's in real trouble I think Blanchfield is really like I said just solid in regards to a Brazilian jiu-jitsu I think if Alpar tries to sweep, reverse or tries to explode back up to her feet. Blanchfield what she'll do is she'll be light in regards to the jiu-jitsu in those moments and she'll be able to float positions so wherever Alpar goes I think Blanchfield will just follow so she can maintain that dominant advantageous position that she's in on the mat I think she's going to be an absolute nightmare for Alpar like I said I think the striking is going to be close if this is a 15 minute kickboxing fight you're probably looking at a very close decision potentially a split decision but I don't see a scenario where this fight just doesn't hit the mat someone's going to engage in the wrestling and once the fight hits the mat, I think Blanchfield's much better offensively, definitely much better offensively, but I also think she's better defensively as well. So for those reasons, I'm picking Erin Blanchfield to win this fight. And in the next fight, this should be a fun one. We've got Impa Kasanganai versus Carlston Harris. Kasanganai is currently the minus 117 slight favourite. The comeback on Harris, the minus 103 slight underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, the betting lines are relatively close. If you've got a solid read on each side, or on either side, should I say, then either side is playable. If you are going to push me for a value side here, I would say the value is on Impa Kasanganai at minus 117. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, the betting line's been crazy here. Impa Kasanganai opened up a minus 185 favourite with Carlston Harris sitting at plus 155. All that money has come in on Carlston Harris. And in some places, at some books, this line is a straight even pick em. So a lot of money coming in on Harris. I do understand the money coming in to some degree, but I think it's coming too far. I do think that the betting line is going to settle roughly where it is right about now, and it wouldn't shock me for both fighters to go in to the fight on Saturday night at that minus 110 pick em line on either side. Now, as for how this fight plays out, I really like Carlston Harris as a fighter. I think he's a solid fighter. He's got... Very awkward stand-up, I will say that. His striking is very unorthodox. It's not very clean or crisp or technical. But the one thing he does pack is power in that right hand. 
but Carlson Harris's game isn't reliant on his striking. Carlson Harris likes to close the distance, tie up with his opponent against the cage and look for trips or throws, takedowns to get his opponent down to the mat. And once he gets his opponent down to the mat, there's no real rush for Carlson Harris if it means him just doing just enough in regards to activity to prevent referees from splitting them up, standing the fighters back up due to inactivity, then Carlson Harris is fine with that. He's more of a fighter that likes to make fights dirty, ugly, likes to grind away. If a position presents itself for a submission, then yeah, Carlson Harris will take it. He's actually got a deadly front choke, dash chokes, anaconda chokes. If you give him his neck, he's going to choke you out. He's really a specialist in that aspect of his submission game. But if that doesn't present himself, he's fine just laying heavy on top and just wasting minutes on the clock and grinding fights out. Now, from Impa Kasanganai's perspective, Kasanganai's not got bad wrestling either. He's got good defensive wrestling. He's very difficult to take down. He can be taken down, and the moments where we have seen him taken down, he will be settled on his back for a few moments, and then he'll try and explode back up to his feet. He's got to be careful in this fight doing that against Harris, because when he does explode back up to his feet, if he gets into that turtle position where he does explode, expose his neck then like I said Harris is going to wrap that neck up and choke you out so that's one thing that Kasangani has got to watch out for but outside of that Impa Kasangani has got really big striking advantages here he's faster he's quicker he's more athletic he's got more volume he throws in combinations he's aggressive when moving forwards as well and this is where I think Carlson Harris is going to get stuck because Harris needs to be the aggressor in this fight advancing forwards so he can tie up with his opponent and take them down and then in regards to the takedowns, we saw Harris take a lot of opponents down on the regional scene, which was great. But the first time he stepped into the UFC, he fought Christian Aguilera, who has since been cut by the UFC. He shot one takedown early on and Aguilera had that covered. He stuffed the takedown and it does make you think was... Harris just scoring a lot of takedowns on the regional scene because the level of competition was much lower. Well, Impa Kasangana is levels above Christian Aguilera, so I do think that Harris is going to have problems with takedowns. I'm not saying he can't get them, but I do think he's going to have some issues. I think Kasangana will be able to defend him, or if he is taken down, just pop straight back up. But like I said, Harris has got to be the one advancing and moving forwards, and that's not going to be the case in this fight, at least not all the time. I think Impa Kasangana is too explosive, powerful, and quick on the feet against the awkward striking of Carlson Harris I think that's going to cause him a lot of problems and Harris has got that trump card of the power right hand but if that doesn't land and if he's moving backwards it's not going to land very often and very hard on Kasanganai. I think the fight's actually going to be won and lost on the feet and that's where I see the advantages for him for Kasanganai. Like I said Harris does have a live opportunity to score a takedown and maybe snatch a neck along the way but ultimately I do think that that outcome is relatively low. Overall I just think Kasanganai is the better fighter, the fighter that's developing more. He's got a good camp as well over at Sanford MMA. That's now his second, or this will be his second fight, fighting out of Sanford MMA. I think he's more explosive and more dangerous, and I think those are the attributes that's going to matter and play a factor in this fight. So for those reasons, I'm picking Impa Kasanganai to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Gustavo Lopez versus Haley Alateng. Alateng is currently the minus 127 favourite. The comeback on Lopez at plus 107 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the value sits with the underdog in Gustavo Lopez at plus 107. Again, I think this fight should be at least a pick -em, but if Gustavo Lopez was minus 120, minus 125, then I wouldn't have an issue with that either. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, the line movement I actually thought was going to go the other way. I thought it was going to be Lopez where the money was coming on, but it does seem to be the money coming in an Alateng. I think that can only go so far though. I think if Alateng gets up to minus 135, minus 140, then we'll just see money coming back in on Lopez from a pure value perspective. So I do think the line where it is now isn't going to move too much. So it's probably going to be around the minus 120, minus 125 line for Haley Alateng come fight night on Saturday night. Now as for how this fight plays out, Haley Alateng is actually a decent fighter. He's got a good box he's got good wrestling he's now training over in Arizona with Eddie Char at fight ready so he's got a good camp behind him as well so he's only going to be developing there like I said his boxing's decent his wrestling is where his background is but in regards to his wrestling it's really strange because 
you don't really see his wrestling in most of his fights until round three, unless he fights Casey Kenny and gets absolutely blasted out of the water for three rounds and can't get his wrestling going anyway. But in regards to his wrestling against Ryan Benoit, all those takedowns came in round three. So it's almost like what happens in the first round or two. I'm, I'm not too sure when it comes to Alatang. I don't know why he waits so long to get his wrestling game going. And he's striking. He does throw heavy with his hands. He's more boxing heavy on the feet. Combinations of two or three punches, got a good one-two combination as well. But the problem that I have with Alateng is his volume and his activity levels. He just doesn't throw too much at any one time. He waits too long. He waits for opportunities to go and strike rather than creating opportunities himself. And that's a real problem. Well, it wouldn't be a real problem if he had his wrestling all the way through the fight, but that's a real problem for him because his volume's low and he doesn't really get his wrestling game going till late in the fight. And what this does is just give his opponent so many opportunities to get themselves in the fight. Pretty much every fight, apart from the Casey Kenny fight, that Alateng is in is just very close, even though he's got really big stylistic advantages. Like he should have been the way better fighter than Ryan Benoit, but he wasn't because he didn't throw. He didn't get his wrestling game going till late. And ultimately that went down to a close split decision that he nearly lost. Now over to Gustavo Lopez. Gustavo Lopez, he is the type of fighter that has constantly got a smile on his face. He's got good movement. He's got good levels of activity. The numbers are quite skewed when it comes to Gustavo Lopez, to be honest, because two of his three fights in the UFC or against Marab Divalishvili, a short notice UFC debut, which, you know, you just can imagine how horrific that must have been for him. And then the other loss that he's got where he couldn't really get his volume going was the fight against Adrian Yanez, who is one of the biggest, brightest prospects in the division. But honestly, if you look at his fights outside of those two monster fights for him, those horrific fights for him, he does have good levels of activity, he keeps his volume up, and he's got decent defensive wrestling as well. Even though, again, the numbers are quite skewed because Marab Divalishvili took him down 30 times, which actually also tells you that Gustavo Lopez has got good defensive Brazilian jiu-jitsu because he was able to constantly get back up to his feet, but also he defended a few takedowns against Marab as well. You know, Marab landed 13 takedowns, as I've said, from 18 attempts, so five of those takedowns were defended. And then when you look at Haley Alateng, he only scored four takedowns against Ryan Benoit from 12 attempts, so Haley Alateng's offensive wrestling versus Gustavo's defensive wrestling. I think in theory, Gustavo Lopez should be relatively okay there. And and then, like I said, it comes down to the striking. You look at Haley Alatang, he's been outvolumed in all three fights that he's had in the UFC. I expect him to get outvolumed here by Gustavo Lopez, who just seems to be a combination striker, a striker that loves to be active. And Gustavo Lopez has got to be careful of the power coming back from Alateng from a counter perspective. But Gustavo Lopez has shown decent durability. He was hit numerous times by Adrian Yanez, who is a solid hitting striker, before he was eventually finished in round three. So I think that the fight is going to have moments for both fighters. I definitely think Haley Alateng is going to have his moments throughout this fight. But the thing is, I just cannot ignore the fact that Alateng has never outvolumed any of his opponents in the UFC. He's made fights much closer than they should have been fights that he was stylistically advantageous in and I just don't think he's got those same style advantages in this fight against Gustavo Lopez. I think Gustavo Lopez is the better fighter with greater activity better volume. I think he's going to outland Haley Alatang. I think he's going to be able to defend a lot of the takedowns. If he is taken down, I think he can pop right back up. So for those reasons, I'm picking Gustavo Lopez to win this fight. And in the final breakdown, we've got Emily Whitmire versus Hannah Goldie. Whitmire is currently the minus 120 favourite, the comeback on Goldie at plus 100 as the slight underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, the betting line's really close. If you've got a good read on either side, then either side is playable. If you are going to push me for a value side, I would say that Emily Whitmire is the better bet at minus 120 than the plus 100 on Hannah Goldie. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, a lot of money's coming on Goldie. Whitmire opened a bigger favourite. I think it was minus 180. All the money's coming on Goldie. Really shortened that line up. I do agree with that line movement, by the way. But now what I think we're left with is the value on Emily Whitmire. And I'm not sure that the betting line really moves too much from this point onwards I think we'll see a bit of money on either side but ultimately I don't think it's a fight that's going to take a lot of action so therefore I think both fighters come fight night on Saturday night the betting line is going to be sitting roughly where it is 
right about now. Now as for how this fight plays out, honestly I've not been massively impressed with Hannah Goldie. She came into the UFC with a little bit of hype because she's a little tank in there. She's absolutely huge. She's a unit. She's physical. But unfortunately her activity levels are quite low. Her striking is there but it tends to be really kick heavy and there are a lot of flashy strikes to the head which will cut it on the regional scene but in the UFC you're going to run into problems and I think that's one issue that she's been having. I do think that her wrestling isn't where her striking is. It's not bad wrestling, especially defensively. She can be taken down. She can score takedowns herself, but it's just not overwhelming, I think is what I'm trying to say. And her jiu-jitsu, I just don't think is very close to a striking at all. Hannah Gold is definitely a striker. Now, with Emily Whitmire, I think Whitmire's problem is inconsistency in performances. Like, she looked decent against Amanda Hebas, to be honest, in moments. But then in the next fight, she just didn't look anything like her last fight, you know, her performance dropped off a cliff. So it's almost hard to trust what Emily Whitmire were going to see inside the cage. I do think that Whitmire has got legit skills, though. I do think that her wrestling is decent when she gets it going. I think her top control and her grappling's improving as well. So I do think that she's strong in those areas. And I think we're going to see a fight here where if the fight's won and lost on the feet, then I think Hannah Goldie should potentially have a slight edge. But if the fight's won and lost in the wrestling and the grappling, I think Whitmire has a greater edge and that's ultimately why I'm leaning towards Whitmire because I feel that the striking is much closer than the wrestling and the grappling with Whitmire having those advantages in the wrestling and grappling. That's where the biggest gap in skill is. So honestly, it wouldn't shock me for Whitmire to come in with that wrestling heavy game plan, score takedowns. I think she'll be able to get takedowns against Goldie. Once she's got Goldie on the mat, I think Goldie will get frustrated. I think she'll struggle to get back up to her feet. At that point, Whitmire might be live for a finish as well. If not, then I do think she can maintain enough top control time to win the round that she's in, in that top position. So for those reasons, I'm picking Emily Whitmire to win this fight and that's all for this episode of on the money line i hope you all enjoyed it and as always fight fans i'd appreciate all the likes to the video and subscriptions to our mma play 365 youtube channel too if i've ever helped you win a bet and win some money with my analysis and predictions then please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel remember you can get all the betting advice you'll ever need over at mmaplay365.com we cater for long-term gamblers that like to build their own bets and strategies gamblers that just want to follow exactly what I bet on, and we also cater for you fun gamblers that like the long shot fun parlays, or hackers, accumulators as we call them in the UK. Even if you only want our best value underdog for the event, which comes with a money back guarantee by the way, we have plenty of different packages and subscription options for you guys to choose from, which also includes our DFS packages for DraftKings and FanDuel. All our subscriptions are at very affordable prices too, just hop on to MMAplay365.com and see what's best for you. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you at the next event.